520. Uh, this is the Will Creighton Church of Christ, uh, Humble, Texas. This is November 20th, 2019. This is our evening service, and our topic is, what does it mean uh, to work in Christ's vineyard? What does it mean to work in Christ's vineyard? I want to encourage you to participate. If you have any questions, because this is an open Bible study, uh, have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, make sure that you voice your thoughts while we're all gathered. We can get it recorded and put it on our YouTube channel as our Brother Frias does on a regular basis so well. Now, Matthew chapter 20, and we will begin at verse uh, number 1. Matthew 20 and 1. The scriptures read for us, For the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like unto a man that is in household, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. Verse 6 says, And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. Said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Verse 7 says, They say unto them, Because no man had hired us. He said unto them, Go ye and so into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying in verse 12, These last have wrought but one hour. And thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. This thou this not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. He says, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine not evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. So now you know this is an interesting uh, story as we read. Because a lot of people, uh, they have a maybe preconceived notion of what this means. What the reference is. But a lot of times we think. The work of the church means to go to church, do good deeds. This may sound odd to you. Have Bible studies and baptize. And we kind of feel like that's the work of the church. That's what it means to go in the vineyard. The rest of our life is for us to kind of do what we want. But see, that's actually the opposite. That's only one portion. That's a direct effort of you trying to do a service to someone to try and tell them about the Lord and a study. Of course, baptize if they agree and a desire to do so and go to church to worship God. And that's why sometimes people unzip Christ, hang him up on the way out the church door and leave him here and put him back on when they come to church. But the idea is that's not the way it is because the vineyard isn't when we come here only. Uh, when you're doing good deeds or baptizing, all those things are important to help study. These are included in the work of the vineyard, but there's more to it. Once you're baptized and added to the church, you're now employed full time with Christ. Each day you wake, you're on the clock. To work in the vineyard is to live the life of a Christian. This is done by God's standards. You do not get to clock out or take a break from Christianity. Regardless if someone is looking at you, if they're watching you or not. 
you are being watched all the time by Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand this reference to the vineyard. Let's go through uh, some of the verses to look at beginning at verse 1. We see he says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he's speaking of the first people hired of the Jews. This is the first group that accepted the Lord because on their Pentecost the message is preached. Uh, the Lord comes to them before the day of Pentecost. They are his chosen children. They are given opportunity to work. And that's what they mean by when I say we're born to heat today. We've been doing this longer than these Gentiles. And this is where the story makes reference. And so it says, but this is what it's like. A man who he hires someone to work his vineyard. Then he goes off uh, and he takes off on an uh, opportunity to go do some other things while they work. And it says that they already agreed for a penny a day. The penny a day represents salvation. God's protection is law for us. And so the Jews, as the scriptures teach, began to get jealous at the fact that the Gentiles are going to be allowed in. Even Jonah, when he was sent to go and teach Nineveh that repentance was needed. Jonah explained to the Lord after he got through preaching one of the shortest messages that most men have heard, eight words, and then he went through the city and then he was gone. And so the idea is that he said, I knew you were a forgiving person, and to paraphrase, he said, I knew you were merciful. He said, that's why I told you I didn't want to go. He said, because I knew what you were going to do, you forgive him. So when he got through preaching, he actually watched to see if they'd be destroyed. So when the Lord lifted up the gourd, the tree, to give him some comfort from the heat of the day, it died very quickly. After bringing him comfort, and he felt more sorrow in his heart for the tree than the people. Now, he didn't say that out of his mouth, but God was reading his heart. See, that's one thing we're talking about. You're on the clock. Once you give your life to the Lord, you're on the clock. And the Lord is always looking at the heart, working with us. And he can watch everyone at the same time. He's never too busy. He's not forsaken the earth, as some may say, and commit sin. And so therefore, he told Jonah, you know, you didn't even labor on this tree. You didn't do anything. Uh, but you went and labor with those people. Look like you want to see some fruit come from your labor. And so the idea is that he could see his heart wasn't as sorrowful for, for the people's state. And one of the things we have to understand is the kingdom of God is so well put together, y'all, that you don't have to have a teacher that really likes you. This may seem odd to you. Because Jonah did not like them. When you go out of your way to go do something for people to where you risk your own life <laughs> in a fish's mouth for three days in his belly, that means you really don't like these people. And you have to understand is, it's not that you want that kind of teaching. But I'm giving you comfort to know your allegiance should be to Christ. Uh, and I said something Sunday speaking that Jesus is your only friend to make emphasis to make sure you understand that I'm not saying we don't have other friends. He's your only true friend. Christ has never forsaken you. Christ has never lied on you. Christ has never backstabbed you. Christ has never given up on you. We give up on the Lord. The Bible says if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. See, we have to make a motion to the Lord. If we forsake the Lord, he will forsake us. See, these are scriptural texts. They can't be disputed. They can't be argued, although people try. So you and I have to understand in our heart that... Christ is the only true friend you have. Because at some point we will get tired of each other. But Christ never gets tired of us. And it isn't just because he's a deity. Because Satan is everlasting too. But he hates our guts. So don't think that Christ just loves us because he is an everlasting spirit. He loves us because he's good. And so does his Father and the Holy Spirit. As well as the angelic host. And we have to understand that and realize there is no... Past God given to Christ. Oh, yeah, you've got to love. No, it is because God is love. And we should be loving like that as well. And so, therefore, as we look at this, if you have a teacher that teaches you correctly, but they may not love you, they may not really care, they may have other motives, but if they teach you correctly and you listen and obey, Matthew 23 says, just don't do what they do, but you will do what they say when they read from the Word of God. You can be saved. That's how much God has put this thing together in a perfect manner. The person that will be lost, though, 
is the teacher. And this is why a lot of people don't challenge teachers. Because we don't realize sometimes we don't really love the teacher. We don't want to confront the teacher. We don't want to call the teacher up and ask him, Hey, why did you say that? I mean, you know, I couldn't find that scripture. Because we really don't love them that much. A lot of times people will say, well, you know, I don't like confrontation, brother. You know, I don't want to argue. But you have to understand, when an individual argues and debates and wrangling, that's different than discussing a subject and being in disagreement. For that much then, Christ was the biggest person that argued on the earth because he constantly was in disagreement with people that were incorrect. And he would say things like, leave them alone, they're blind, they're just blind. That doesn't mean Jesus doesn't care, just they can't be helped. So people like to pull the argue card out a lot, real fast. Because what it does is it gives me a pass card to not do my job, which is to love. And I'm supposed to love. Jesus looked at the rich man, and the Bible says before he told him the bad news, the Bible says he looked at him and he loved him. And then he told him what he lacked. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. You have treasure in heaven. And he knew that was going to be bad news. Jesus knew the guy would walk off. But that's what the Bible says. He looked at him and he loved him. See, when you really love someone, you will risk the friendship, the 30, 40, 50 years you've known them. The many things they've done for you. They were there when grandma died. They were there when you had your surgery. They helped pay for your house. You put all that on the table. And you say. This is what you need to do. And they take all that love and walk away. And that's what we fear. And that's why we do not tell people. That's one of the reasons. We do not tell people. Brother, sister, you're wrong. When we are sure. Even when we are sure. That we are right. Because we really don't love them. Like we said. And we become. We're like Jonah. And we look at Jonah. And Jonah looks like a real bad guy at that point in his life. But God asks him. Simply says. Is it right? That you should want me to destroy all these people. And all this cattle. Is that right? Do you think that's the right? See and he constantly is talking to Jonah. And the story stops there. We see Jesus speaking well of Jonah, so we know he must have gotten it together. But the idea is that you and I have to understand, we have to get it together. Because no, it's more to than just coming to church, teaching and baptizing, and even counseling people, helping people with family issues. It's bigger than that. You could help somebody be saved, and you could easily be lost yourself. Just as Jonah was on the brink of that edge. Because those people, the Ninevites, they loved that message so. They even put sackcloth and ash on the animals, which was highly unusual. Ultimate repentance. And so therefore, we have to understand that you and I. And so now we look at this vineyard and we see that the time frame is split up into these sections. So for you and I, the third hour would be about 9 o'clock. So he starts out early in the morning, goes out at 9 o'clock, then he goes out throughout the whole day. The 11th hour wouldn't be 11 o'clock. It would be like around 5 o'clock in the evening for us. And that means the day is about over with. The work day is just about done in this vineyard. But he brings these individuals in. Now some of them have started around maybe 6 o'clock in the morning. Sun first came up. And they've worked all the way to 6 o'clock in the evening. And you would say, well, man, I can see why they would be angry. But why? He told them, I'll pay you a penny. So okay. Now this is the type of penny you and I know. But so I'll pay you a penny. Okay. But then when you see someone else getting paid, the same with you. You know, like, hey, we work longer. And this is why the Lord says, I didn't do you any wrong. I told you what I would give you. The Jewish nation felt it was supposed to get something more than everyone else. They even said in Malachi, your ways are not right, God. Your ways are not even. You uh, bless unrighteous people too. And the Lord said, I'm going to judge you for saying that. Said, My way is all right. He said, your way is not right. Bringing me these animals with one eye, lame animals, holding back the offering you're supposed to give and coming treading my courts with 
animals and crying on why am I not with you, he said. Open up your heart, do that which is right. Divorcing your wives left and right when they get old. He said, do that which is right. He said, I have many issues with you. I said, I'm he says, I want to judge you. My way is all right, he said, because I do bless those that do right. And those that do wrong, I punish for the purpose of helping them. Anybody have any questions, comments so far? Okay, all right. So now let's look at some thoughts here from our text. Let's go down to uh, verse number 3. And he went out at about the third hour, Matthew 20 and 3, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So this is the Lord's message to us. He says, I go out looking for you. I go out looking for you. How? I send servants to go out looking for you. But this represents, it is actually the law that's in our heart causing us to tell people. The law is looking for you and me. Believe me, when we came to the law, you and I were not looking for him. See, the scriptures teach us that. We were in sin when the Lord came to us. Hey, it's time to go to work for me. And that's every human being. No, every, even if you were studying the scriptures, you still weren't living the life. You can't live the life without Christ. As good a man as Nathaniel was, an Israelite in Behum was no God. He still needed Jesus. He still needed Jesus. And so the idea is that he says, um, he went out standing idle. That's our life before Christ comes. You're just idle. You're not just idle. We're actually doing nothing. We're making money. We're going to some kind of church. Like I remember when I was going to the Catholic church. See, that's idle spiritual. That's idle. Because you're not doing anything spiritually. Even the Jews who held on to Judaism, as the message began to spread from Jerusalem to Judea to all of Samaria and to the world, all those Jews, they actually become idle now because they've heard this message that this lifestyle is over. Christianity is the way now. So anything after that is idle. But the Lord shows His love and said, Go you also unto the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out the sixth hour, the ninth hour. About three o'clock would be the ninth hour. Did likewise. And so we see this group at the eleventh hour. And this represents you and I, the Gentiles. We're like last on the list. You know why? Because we were idolaters. Do you know the whole land that the Lord speaks of? The land of milk and honey. You know who ruled that? The Gentile nations. And they gave a false god named Baal credit. The God of agriculture for having given them all that. That's what they had everything. And people knew the Canaanites, that area, they've got it all. But God told Abraham, before he died, he said, I want you to know, you're going to get this, your children will get this land. He said, because these people that are here now, they have not made me angry enough to take it. So what does that mean? That tells me that while God's talking to Abraham, he's still trying to work with the Canaanites. Way back then, get him to know, no, it's not Baal, it's me. Sending people to tell him, no, it's me, the name's not Baal. It's not like that God. And then when his anger finally reaches his peak, that's when you see Israel coming in and taking over the land. And you have to beware yourself. When you have something in your life that God has given you, a life of cleanliness to walk up right before the Lord and you know that's in your heart and you're doing that and then you start to take that for granted. You know the Lord according to the problem of the talent he will come and take what you have if you just have one thing left and give it to someone that has all because he says he knows what to do with it. In the parable of the talents one of the gospel writers says the people said but Lord he has ten. So you got a guy with five and one with ten and one with one. He says, why don't you give it to the one with ten? He says, because to him who has more, I'm going to give him more. Because to he who has a lot, much is required. See, people don't realize. Sometimes you seem like you're doing work, maybe in the church or maybe in life. And then someone comes up to the job and gives you something else. You go like, man, why don't they give it to me? Because you're responsible. You get the job done. You're accountable. Say, so, well, this guy's good too. He's not as good as you. Say, so well, how can a guy with this much stuff, or a lady with this much stuff to do, be able to take on more? Because you're a good manager. And some people can manage their spiritual life very well. And some people can't hold on to even the one last thing they've got. And the Lord said, I'm going to take that from you. He told the churches in Revelation, hold fast to that 
which remains, water remains. He says, that's your, you're going to lose that too. He'll tell a church that a congregation. Sometimes all the saints are holding on to at a church is faith only. He says, you better hold on to that until I send you somebody to help you. Or else I'll take that too. Why? Because you got to understand something about the Lord. He doesn't have to give us anything, y'all. Saints and visitors alike, listeners around the world, He doesn't have to give us. God is not sitting in heaven going, oh, I'm so lonely, I can't wait till everybody gets it. That's, that's not it. Do you know that when you and I were put into the vineyard, we became a liability and a problem to God? How do we know? The book of Isaiah, the Lord says clearly, when I measured man, and I take time to calculate his value. All the men I've made. He says when I weigh it he is less than nothing. That's a negative number. We all know about negative number. Less than zero. All the men together. That would include Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. Why is it like that? Then why does he love us? That's why the psalmist says, What is man that you're mindful of him? What do you love us? The psalmist knows we're nothing. You told us in Isaiah we're nothing. But because God is love and he's everything, he loves you and me. Though we be not worthy. Jesus said in the gospel that if you did everything your father asked you to, he said you would count yourself as unprofitable servant. Because you only did that which was asked. What does that mean? We don't have the ability to create anything and bring to God and say, look what I did. And if we did, which we don't, everything he asked, we would still be unprofitable. Meaning we did not produce anything because he has to tell us what to do. Then he has to give us desire to do it, the will to do it, and the strength to endure. He's everything. That's why you can never take him for granted. You cannot look at whatever situation you're in and blame God. Satan is your adversary and your enemy. God is your only true friend. And if you ever get those lines blurred, you will have some issues in life. And so therefore, look at verse 8. He says, so in the evening come, it's come time to pay now. These guys began to complain. But look at what the Lord says in verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what is I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So now the simple thought of the Jewish nation asking that they should get more. Are these true vineyard workers in this parable saying we should get more because we've been here longer. Is the same equivalent for you and I today to think because we've been in the church for multiple years that we should get some extra honor and respect. There's a lot of brethren who think that way. I've been preaching for 45 years. That doesn't mean anything. You still might not know what you're talking about. They had many men older than Jesus Christ. And they told him, you're not even 50 years old. But when Jesus told them, before Abraham was, I am, he was right. But they did not know and did not want to believe that before Abraham was, Christ is. And he says, he rejoiced when he saw my day. So he knew more than them, yet he was much younger than them. And so the idea is what you and I have to understand is Elihu, in the book of Job, he knew more than Job and the three guys, all four of them. He said, you guys are very old. He says, and I thought that wisdom came with age. He said, but there's a spirit in man and the Almighty has to give him that knowledge. See, just because you get old does not mean that you gather spiritual wisdom. You may gain some physical wisdom. You've done some things wrong. You know it doesn't work. You've seen people go to jail. So you know don't do that. That's not spiritual wisdom. God this Spiritual wisdom comes from God. You have to humble yourself. And that's what Elijah said. They didn't even, Job wouldn't even look at him. He didn't even acknowledge him. But when Elihu was through speaking. The next voice you hear is God. And God said. Who is this that's asking all these questions? Gird up your loins and stand before me. See, because the only guy that told them the answer was Elijah. And when he told Job, you make a sacrifice for your three friends that were four that spoke. Let him know the three older guys were all wrong. All three of them. Does that mean we disrespect old people? Absolutely not. What we respect is what comes out the mouth. Does it match this book? This is this one of the things that I've been looking at this week. And it's been very discouraging to me. 
And the older I get, the more discouraging it gets. Is how can there be so much confusion with one book that says one thing? It's easy. You often hear people say it all the time. Five people can look at a scripture in all five different areas. That's because all five are incorrect. Only one of them is right. But it's not the book's fault. It has nothing to do with it being written in the old lineage. Listen, all the new translations, new NIV, all those, listen, they do nothing to change or make this any more clear. I see people with NIVs and still do not know what they're talking about. I mean, you look and say, man, you could have got that answer in the old English. I mean, the old English is not that difficult. Thou is you. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really, we had a VBS one time, we, we did that. We put out those words, what those words mean. I watched WOT and we were laughing about knowing the meanings, but all the meanings were able to be found. But sometimes we'll go to school for chemistry, we'll be math majors, math whiz, doctors of philosophy. And everyone that has lost, this book is like a 747 over the head. Even lawyers who lose, they use this language regularly. Therefore, hitherto, they love the Latin. They love the original, the only. And they'll look at the Bible and go, how can these things be? Because you can't just read this book. You have to have a motive on why you want the answer. If it's to love God and to love the saints and to love the world, you'll get it every time. The Lord asked the two disciples of John when they were walking off. When he walked off, they came behind him. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, follow him. And he turned and looked at both of them and he said, What are you looking for? What a, what a statement to say to somebody that wants to follow you. That's what he wants. The Lord wants to know, What are you coming to me for? What do you want from me? Some people come for wealth. Children of Belial are believers who hang around the church to get blessings and prayers. Just as they did in David's army. Just as they did in Israel. They would go to the temple and fight in David's army for the benefits. They knew if I stick with David, I'll be protected to a certain degree. And that's what sons and daughters of Belial do. They come to church to ask for prayer. They come to church every Sunday sometimes. They'll tell you how to be safe, but they won't make it in because they're there for another reason. But, but, but in actuality, they're not going to teach error, no. But they have a different motive. See, God judges the heart. Because remember, when you're in the vineyard, you're on the clock all the time. It's not just when I come to church. Not just when I'm praying for somebody. Or we don't have a prayer over the phone. We've got five people on, online. That's not it. It's when I'm by myself. When I'm laying in the bed looking at the ceiling. What am I thinking about? God knows what we're thinking about. And so therefore, the law said, The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Who were first? The Jews. And they became last. And the Lord says, in another part of the gospel, He's clear. He says, very clear. The harlots, which are prostitutes, the, the drunkards, the people of the world, they go into the kingdom before you. Why? Because when they heard, they knew, man, I'm a prostitute. This this is not the life. Mama told me don't do this. The drunkard, you know, dad said don't drink. His life was ruined. And they came to the Lord. And listen. The Jews criticized him. Talked about him. Many of them. He's not the Messiah. He divides the people. So they ended up coming in last later. And that's what the statement meant. First shall be last and last shall be first. Let you know that God is an equal opportunity employer. God doesn't care what your race is. Where you're from. He doesn't care if of your family's background. He doesn't care if you're noble. He doesn't care if you're rich. He doesn't care if you're poor. He doesn't care if you're in jail or free. God's son cares about will you give me your life. I'll give it back to you later. Sometimes people wonder, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to give him my life or give it back to me later? You have a life right now that you're living and you're not a member of the church. You're basically doing what you want. You have a few rules you follow. Mom, dad, grandma said something from the Bible. So you follow that. A couple other rules of the land. What you can get away with, you try to do. 
You may even be going to church somewhere. Maybe even telling people. You may have even dip people in water in the belief system you have. But you're basically living your life. But if you give your life to the Lord, you have to give that up. And then He will give you a burden that's not heavy, which is faith in whatever He said. And then the thing that you have on the earth now, this life, it will become everlasting after you die. You will resurrect to everlasting life. And so the idea is that that's what the law says. Give me your life now. And I will return it to you. One of the things we have to look at is we're protected from Satan by the prayers of Christ. Look at Luke chapter 22. This is why we want to walk a faithful Christian life. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. God said, what's the benefits of working in the vineyard? What is the penny? What is that payment? Luke 22 and verse 31 he says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, I desire to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. I don't know if you've ever seen those wheat, wheat sifters. Man, if you're not real wheat, you get stuck on top. That means all of Simon's sins, Satan will shake. And you know what Satan does with us? He shake us. He would shake us if Christ wouldn't pray for us. And he'd go, look God, look what I find in your girl and your boy. Look what I find. Look what they're doing. And I, I was with them. I saw it. There's an Old Testament story where Joshua the high priest, his hat is dirty, his clothes are dirty, and Satan is standing out by the angel accusing him. Look what he did, look what he did. And the angel tells him, shut up, and he stops talking. And he says, take those clothes off and put them on something clean. He says, now if you will lead my people, I'll be with you. That also shows leaders sometimes get in trouble. When they air out to be honest enough to come forward, correct the error. But sometimes leaders err and the congregation wants to destroy them. Put them on a cross like Christ and not forgive. And that's one of the things why we have to check and see in our heart. Do we really love the elders, the deacons, the Bible teachers in the congregation? Do we really love the evangelists? Do we really love them? Would you really go and tell them they've done something wrong? That, that, that's just not in the Bible what you're saying. Brother, you're going to cause people to err. If you love them, you will. Yeah, some of them may call you out. They may call you out from the pulpit. Now I've seen it with my own eyes. And everybody will know, he's talking about me. But if you love them, you'll do it. Because that's what they did to the law. They talked about him for doing what was right. See, that's, that's what the law judges. See, when you're on the clock, the law is judging the heart all the time. Not that he's hovering over you, breathing behind your neck like a boss making you nervous. He's saying, I'm praying for you that the devil don't sift you like wheat. At the same time, verse 32 says, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. So that means the Lord would expect to see the faith remain. And when thou art converted, he says, strengthen our breath. So now, nah, now nah, here we go. Now nah, we got it. That's why you got to tell the leader and the follower. I thank you very. Sometimes we don't have a problem telling a young person that's gotten off track and we're older than them. You know, I have a problem with that. But then the older person, you're younger. It's hard to be Elihu sometimes. It's hard to be Elihu. But God supported what Elihu said. He would support you. It doesn't mean that Job and his friends said, well, thanks, young man. God bless you, man. <laughs> no. But at the judgment, Elihu will be told, yes. He's done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful of a few things, now I'll make you a ruler over many. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. That's what you want to hear. You don't need uh, the approval of the person that you've had to tell that they're in error. Very rather you get that. But the approval comes from God. See, if our relationship is perfect vertically, it won't be any problem horizontally. Get the vertical line right. Make sure that Christ is at the center. There's no particles or people in between. And then horizontal is a cakewalk. Because you can go through anything because the Lord will be with you. You are guided safely by the light of God. When you're in the vineyard. Look at Psalm 119 verse 105. You know this is a psalm. This is the longest song in the psalm. 119. You know they sung this. Can you imagine singing this? Sometimes 
Man, we can hardly give the Lord a few minutes in worship service without looking at the clock. Is it over yet? He's taking, he's gone three minutes over. I can't believe that. But look at this, Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word, the word shines out where you can see. Don't go here, don't get with this group. They're not right with God. Don't get with this group here. They're not doing right. You can't hang out with your cousin anymore because he doesn't love the Lord like you. And it also lightens where your feet are at, where you are at in your walk. Sometimes someone will say something to us and we'll get mad and we'll walk off. We, we won't say a word and we may smile and walk off. And we're saying things in our mind. God's hearing every word. When you know I shouldn't think like that, God. Don't let the devil fool you. And he says he's done with you. No, he's not. No, that's where the devil comes. No, no, you cast that voice out. I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't have thought that way. Forgive me. And it's done. See, the devil comes. No, nah, man, he's not going to forget this one. He, he's done. And then something bad happened in your life. You automatically go, he's cursed me. No, God is not like that. His mercy endures forever. He's more merciful than we know, but he's also more strict than we know. And that's why you have to wait and let him tell you. If you're walking right. If you're doing the things that are right. Sometimes none of us can speak to you about it. The subject may be so private. You can't even tell me about it. You can always tell God. You can always tell God. You're given instructions. That cause you. To make good decisions. See this is. Look at uh, Proverbs 1. It's one thing you got to realize. You, you know what makes our walk with God so difficult. I'm going to tell you what makes it. You say, oh, that you think you know all? No, I don't. But I do know God knows all. What makes our walk difficult with God is he already tells us my thoughts are higher than your thoughts as the sky. You know the sky is endless. I hope everybody knows the sky is endless. You get past the soul system, up, up, up we go. So that means God's thoughts are forever past yours. So when God says a thing and it shakes you to the core, Relax. Immediate response. Prayer. God help me have strength to accept this. This is heavy for me. I never heard nothing like this. I didn't even know this was in the Bible. But because God gives us instructions. Saints he expects them to be carried out. Because why? He gives us instruction. Picture this. You give a person a new car. No gas in it. You have a truck come and fill it up with gas. And you say I expect to see you at 12 o'clock. Three miles down the road. You're going to have a problem if they're not there at 12 o'clock. Three miles down the road with a brand new car. And a tank full of fuel. That's how the Lord is. Like, you're supposed to meet me here. I filled you up. What happened? There's no explanation you can give. Other than I, I, I didn't want to come and meet you. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have did that. You can't debate that you were right. You can't debate. You bless other people. You do this. Mm -mm. It's, I'm sorry. I should have met you. He accepted like that. If you're telling the truth. Proverbs 1 and 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Why? Why did he write these? To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. So we have three things. To know wisdom. And instruction. See, wisdom and instruction make it work. In all thy getting, the Bible says, get understanding. See, you have to have all these components. Like a Rubik's excuse, you got to have all of it lined up. All colors on the right side. He says, to perceive the words of understanding. See, so I can grab it. It's like reaching out for something. I can grab it. To give subtlety. I want to miss verse 3. To receive the instruction of wisdom. See, so you need all that to receive. When instructions start coming out, it's like going through training. Some of you have gone through training. We're almost done. Some of you have gone through training. And when you get out of school, or your training process, <laughs> I remember being in the military and stuff, you get out of a certain process, going to different schools. <laughs> the world is like different. It's like, man, what is this? You got the basics, but the application and the configuration and oh we don't do it that way here you're like what and it almost you know okay now I need to listen to this guy see what they're talking about I need to listen to her you have a problem with listening to women and you find out your boss your supervisor is going to be a woman 
I thought I was going to work for Bob. No, Susan's better. And now Susan's five feet three. You're six feet four with muscles. She's going to tell you what to do. You have to listen to Susan because she knows what to do. And you have to understand, to receive the instruction of wisdom, you have to humble, I have to humble myself before God. <laughs> justice, to know how to, the things should be done. It's like a, justice has been done in this case. Judgment, which side should I choose? You know, your walk is like a fork in the road. When you step, the, you keep coming to forks. And sometimes your life feels like you're like, man, why is it always two decisions? Because God Himself already told you way back here what to do. But you want to listen to it. Now you got to go all the way back and start here because you took the wrong turn back there. And that's how we do it driving all the time. You turn, go back, and start over. But in spiritual walk, it's hard. Because the vineyard is your everyday life. And every day. Sometimes as soon as you walk out the door, sometimes as soon as you get out the bed, there's a fork. Oh, man. I didn't get to brush my teeth yet. There's a fork already here. Two things. Which one do I pick? Equity. Is it balanced? Is what you're doing is balanced? Nebuchadnezzar, some, the Lord said, I wage you today. You're not balanced. And now you have to die. Because I spent all this time trying to keep you balanced and you just won't stay balanced. To give subtlety to the simple. See, the simple person has to be wise like a serpent. The Lord said, be wise as a serpent, harm to the So the simpleton runs into trouble, so he gains wisdom from this, from this book. He learns how to be coy, how to be quiet. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Wow. That means I don't have to wait. If I'm 20, I don't have to wait till I'm 60 to know this. I can read this book. When I, when I remember when I read it, I said, man, this proverb book, even before I was a Christian, I said, this book is something else. But I wasn't a Christian and I still blew it. So can you have Christianity with this? You look at Proverbs now, you got it. Find the verse 5. A wise man will hear, so he gives a summation. He says, okay, so this is what I'm writing it for. And then he gives a warning. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. See, you can, you can get it. It doesn't make sense. My friend Tommy says, your mom and dad are just old fogies. And all, all, all. Tommy doesn't know. Wise counsel you can attain if, if you hear. Swift to hear, slow to wrath. Slow to speak, the Bible tells us. So, does anybody have any final thoughts? Close us out. God bless you. If you're here now, remember the Church of Christ. There's an opportunity for you to be baptized. Acts 19, 1 through 5 shows us that an individual can easily think that they are saved by having been dipped in water. But there's a question that was asked in the book of Acts 19. A question was posed that they did not know. Now, if they've been baptized, every baptized believer already knows this. It's one question. He said, have received all the Ghost since you believe. I remember telling people that. I said, I'm going to ask people that. Me be here to talk about the law. Y'all yeah, been blood bought by the blood of the Lamb. I said, yeah. I said, did you receive all the Ghost since you believe? Oh, yeah. I said, how'd you get it? Well, I was, I was sleeping one night. And he sat at the edge of my bed. And he told me, we will be one. I said, mm. I said, nah. I said, can you read that for me? But well, you can't judge me. I say, yeah, I have to judge that. I say, because now that question is what I did, because I didn't see that. He said, well, it don't matter. We get the Holy Spirit different ways. I said, mm, that's another one. Can you read that one? And see, to you, that may be confrontation. <laughs> that's fact. See, because I may be wrong. Maybe we don't get him in baptism. Maybe he should sit at the edge of the bed. See, this is what you have to understand. The scriptures do not teach that. The scriptures teach. How you receive the Holy Spirit. And if you think you have them any other way, we know for a fact you don't. See, we know for a fact you don't. Because then now the whole Bible is to be questioned. And we can do like the rest of the world. Let's just close it and love each other. God loves us all. Uh, no, not like that. They said that we're not so much as heard about there be any Holy Ghost. John talked about the Holy Ghost. They're talking about what Paul asked them. Receiving him. Well, I've heard in the Holy Ghost like that. Receiving. Because John did not teach that. Verse 
3 said to them unto what then were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John truly baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they said, Okay, Paul, we love you. God speeds your works. We're not going to judge you. Don't judge us. We're going to serve the Lord. No. These were honest people. They said they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean in the name of the Lord Jesus? You get his character and you get his authority. People try to make that more than what you get his character. You can be like him now. I can read Proverbs now and get it. You get his authority. You have the authority now to say. The person that baptized these 12 before had no authority to say. That's why going in water meant nothing. Now this guy, Paul, has authority to say. If you didn't know that, you need to ask some questions before you leave. Now, uh, hit the triangle and call the number at the bottom of the uh, audio. So that you understand wherever you're at, we have to answer these questions because your soul isn't safe. Because we don't just believe we're saved. We have to obey the instruction that leads to salvation. If you believe that, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. But here's the bad promise. Remember, fork in a row. He that believes not shall be damned. People are afraid to repeat what the law said. That's not a curse word. That means cursed. Tossed away. And let me encourage us to know one thing. Hell is not a place where you go to bed. And neither is heaven. When you were created, you will never sleep. You are an eternal being because you came from God and you'll never sleep. You'll always be woke. Your spirit is always woke. You either be woke in heaven enjoying the Lord and the pleasures or being tortured in hell. See, people don't like to talk about that because it's a negative. It's a negative. But it's a fact. But we talk about all the other negatives. Don't steal, you go to jail. Don't sell drugs, you go to jail. Don't drown your baby, you'll go to jail. But we talk about every negative but the spiritual. Why? Because Satan has deceived us. He's sifting us. And some of us, he's going to take to the Lord and say, look what I found. Because Christ has prayed for us. Sometimes we won't listen. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. They asked Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The question is answered. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sins, and you shall see to get the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto your children, unto all that are far, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words that he testified and he exhorted them, which is encouraged, save yourself, which means all the Jewish nation was lost, from this unto all, which means perverted generation. Then they that glad to see a word were baptized the same day, about 3,000 souls were added unto them. And that's not a lot compared to those were there. But I know God was very happy because one soul coming forth to the Lord is more than enough. More than enough. Because one soul is worth more than all the things that God has made. At the end, the only thing will be left are the souls of men. We have to accept that. We believe that. We know they contend in the apostles' doctrine. The fellowship to walk in the light as Christ is in the light. In the breaking of bread and prayers. And the Lord added to the church daily, such should be saved. Acts 2.47. You know, it's amazing. The eunuch headed back home to Ethiopia. That's a long chariot ride. All the way back. My goodness, that's a long ride. But yet he's reading his Bible in the desert. Hot. And Philip comes and explains to him Isaiah 53. And all of a sudden, he's talking about water. That's not in Isaiah 53. Jesus is not in Isaiah 53. Son of God is not even in Isaiah 53. But he's taught him the New Testament and explained the old. And he says, see, here's what the enemy be baptized. He says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why is that in Isaiah 53? You have to have a New Testament to explain salvation. In the New Testament era, he stops the chair and he baptizes him. And he's saved. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the church. Colossians 1, 18. Well, the Jew or Gentile bond the free and have all been made to drink in the one spirit. One of the things that impressed me so about the Lord is love was you can be on death row and be baptized and be saved. And the person that causes you to die could die lost and outlive you physically, but you'll be saved because you gave your life to the Lord. That's powerful. That's how much God loves us. 
and it saves the soul. 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22 is a like figure. Well, to even baptism does also now save us. So we don't have to worry about the thief on the cross. See, it says now saves us. So no one will be teaching that before Jesus dies on the cross and his burial on the third day rolls again. So he's clear. Now saves us. Not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh. We know it's not the wall. But his answer of a good conscience to our God, I have inquired. Answer, I have reached for him properly. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it has its power. That's why the explanation is in parentheses. It's explaining in the text. The Holy Spirit is explaining because he knows the devil's going to try to lie. So he explains how. Then he explains the who. Verse 22. He says, he explains who is going to heaven. That's Christ. On the right hand of God. Angels, authorities, power, subject to him. Key word, they were made subject to him. God brought them to their knees. and You will be subject unto my son. So our Savior tells us in Revelation 2.10, the oh, the devil should cast some of you into prison. Some of us are a big problem for the devil. So you box us in a physical prison. Something physical. Something health-wise. Something financial. Maybe someone's giving you a hard time. You just can't get away from it on the job. That's all right. He says, but be thou faithful on the day you receive everlasting life. Everlasting life. The Lord tells us, I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you alone. If you ever think you're alone, you need to call me or call one of the leaders. You are never alone. Christ is there in your darkest hour. All he wants you to do is acknowledge him and lean on him. He'll be with you. He has never, ever failed us yet. If anybody needs to be baptized, just stay standing when we sit down. We sing a verse of a song. But if you need prayer also, and you're here, I encourage you to pray. Two or more gather together in his name. He's in the midst of us. God will hear us. He will help you with what you need. Come now all together we stand and sing heaven's invitation. And tenderly Jesus is calling. Calling for